please welcome Dr. Mike Dorkin. Right, uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you for that, that panel. Lots of questions there I have, um, but hopefully we'll have time to discuss over, over lunch and later on during the next couple of days. Uh, uh, we are running uh, short of time, but it's good, good to have great discussions. Um, uh, and this means that I can spare our next speaker um, my 10-minute introduction uh, uh, for him. Uh, I first was privileged to meet Don Berwick um, over 20 years ago now um, at IHI, uh, but also in, in, in one particular meeting in an airport uh, in, uh, called Heathrow Airport in London where my role was to uh, um, meet him on his way from one capital city to another capital city uh, to try and persuade him to come to the UK uh, and uh, deliver a review of the state of safety across the NHS in England. And Don, in his usual way, uh, was able to do that, but by bringing together a team of people who uh, asked, as we've heard several times this morning, asked the right questions. Uh, unless we ask the right questions, uh, we uh, lose our way in finding the solutions that are important for our services and our patients and our staff. So on several occasions now, Don Berwick has helped many countries around the world and particularly the UK. Uh, but uh, last year, um, those of you who are able to be lucky to be present when he gave a, his talk last year, um, will remember his letter to the president. Um, and the letter to the president really set out a blueprint of what was needed for us to change, for you to change in the US, but to use that as a template for global change uh, at national levels. And so uh, what I'm really looking forward to is uh, his view today, uh, not just of a, another letter, because out of his work with, um, as I think as a co-chair of the PCAST uh, safety team with, with Joe and others, uh, he's managed to get this at the highest level uh, and hopefully very shortly we'll hear uh, of, of how that will pan out for the populations across this great country of the United States of America. So can I please now ask uh, Don uh, to come up uh, and uh, uh, give his presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Please welcome Don Berwick. Thank you so much, uh, Mike, uh, for that introduction and for our friendship through the years. Uh, you, mean, you mean a ton to me. Uh, it's a real um, pleasure to be back here uh, at the Patient Safety Medical Foundation. Um, it really has become part of my my life, it feels, thanks to the generosity and friendship of Joe Chiani. Um, and I just want to begin, I hadn't planned on this, but to notice something, which is that compared to even a few years ago, um, we, or I'll say I, would not have the sense of community that I feel in this room today. Walking into this room uh, among you and seeing of pioneers and courageous leaders who have been at this now for m m many more than two decades. Mike Durkin himself, for example, Michelle Schreiber at, at, at CMS, Peter Lockman, who plays on the, the global stage, um, and, uh, and, and so many of you. I also want to comment on one other thing. If you look at the program, and I'll be going over this a bit more, and say what What's happened in the public sector, I mean, in the, in the governmental sector, it's, it's really stunning. Um, I think that it's kind of a, a game in this country, to, in the United States, to take pot shots at government for what it cannot do, for what it gets wrong. But when you think about the amount of productive work that is going on in agencies throughout our federal government, uh, it's stunning. Uh, you'll hear from Craig Gumscheidt uh, later today, I believe. Michelle, I mentioned that her leadership at CMS. Uh, there's hardly a relevant um, government agency that isn't really doing stuff to try to get the patient safety agenda and more generally the quality agenda uh, onto the screen. I, I, I hope we can together 
express our gratitude toward uh, those public servants who are really making this take shape. That would not have been possible to say uh, even five years ago, let alone 10 years ago. And a special shout out to the OIG. I was in uh, office running Medicare and Medicaid when uh, Dan Levinson, the OIG, the Inspector General at that time, and I believe Ruth Ann was there as well, began to bring to me their reports using the trigger tool and other very disciplined methods. Uh, it was absolutely catalytic. Uh, the OIG not engaged in that activity at that time, uh, we would have m had much less traction in the government to call uh, the attention of the Secretary of HHS uh, and others to how important this is. So, so Ruth Ann, I want to give a special tip of the hat to you and your colleagues at the OIG's office. I saw government at its very best in that work. So look, the, the good news is we are a community, and that community did not exist. It was just nascent uh, at the time that Tuaris Human appeared, and now it's taking shape, and it's global. Uh, Mike and his colleagues in the UK have done terrific things. I see the same in Scandinavia. Um, it's also become uh, uh, central to a lot of important uh, research and academia. I see Naj here at the front and his, uh, his wisdom and his expertise uh, is just, it's unbelievable, Naj, what you're able to offer us in terms of what to do. Um, and then patience. Uh, Helen's here and many others. The, the patient voice is no longer pro forma, I believe. I think that we, we now know we'll never get where we're going without not just empowerment of patients, but shift of the, of the, uh, the keys to the car to the patients and patient families. So we've got a lot to celebrate. My remarks are a little bit differently keyed. And actually, Philip, I don't know if you know if he uh, anticipated this, in his very final comments uh, kind of set it up beautifully for me. We're, we're describing stuff that's happening at the global level, the national level, uh, states, governments, uh, organizations, aggregate levels. Um, but Philip, in his, in his final comments, talked a bit about this theme of moving more toward back to the individual, back to what, what's happening in the hearts and minds of each individual. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, to, to, to give away my punchline, I don't think we're going to get patient safety where it needs to be without deep and real connection to the hearts of, of the individual clinician and patient and family member about what they really care about. The concept we're going to drive patient safety from the outside in with requirements and metrics and pay for performance and value based this and that, it isn't going to work. It isn't going to work. This is too hard. This has to be as much as possible an inside out job for those thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people who go to work every day to help patients and families uh, are able to do what their hearts tell them to do. And that's a bit of what I want to talk about now. And I'm going to draw from my own experience. Now, a lot of what I'm going to be saying, I, I have included in some prior safety talks this year. If you were in one of them and feel this is repetitive, it's a beautiful day outside. I suggest you just <laughs> quietly leave and take a nice walk on, on, on the beach. But, um, but it's a message I really want to convey. It, it, it has been a very long time since I saw my last patient as a practicing doctor. I really do miss it. I, I, I kind of called it wrong. I wish I'd been able to keep my, my, my uh, foot in, in that game. Um, but time has not uh, faded my memory of errors in my own care. Those, those memories haunt me, and I want to share three of them with you. The first is a story of an exchange transfusion gone wrong. Most of you in this room uh, 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 who are not my age will have no idea what an exchange transfusion is. It's, a, it's the exchange of the blood of a baby whose blood is incompatible with the birth mother's so that the mother's immune system attacks the baby's blood cells because the baby's blood cells in this case are Rh positive. Um, nowadays, it doesn't happen anymore because we built a better tool, uh, an immunization, Rogam, that keeps babies from stimulating the mother's immune system. But in those days, as a young resident, I was up many nights at 3 in the morning cannulating a baby's uh, blood vessels, getting blood from the blood bank, and exchanging the baby's blood for the blood bank blood to save the baby's life. 
in a condition known as erythroblastosis fetalis. Uh, in this case, I was awoken at 3 in the morning for an exchange transfusion with uh, baby Jones. And um, that's where the story begins for me and returns to me every time I tell the story viscerally. I sweat thinking about this. I woke up. Uh, the nurse brought me to the baby's bedside. I connected the blood and all the tubing, and I began to exchange the blood, but it didn't go well. Something was wrong. The baby got sicker and sicker. The heart rate rose, and I, uh, I just knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. I stopped the transfusion. By this time, the baby was desperately ill. I telephoned the on-call covering physician, the, the specialist, uh, neonatal in, uh, intensive care resident, Mike, who came in from his home, that's where he was in those days, and arrived just as the lab report came to, to, to me uh, that I, on the bloods I'd sent on baby Jones, and it was awful. Uh, the lab report said something astonishing, which was that the, um, the uh, baby Jones hematocrit, the percent of blood cells, the percent of his blood that was blood cells, was 95%. And you and me, it should be 40%. In other words, this baby's blood was not liquid. It was just cells. The plasma component, the straw-colored fluid in which the blood cells float, uh, was basically gone. And this baby had a situation which was not compatible with life. In fact, that baby went into renal failure. Mike immediately spotted why that had happened. Um, and that is that... Um, the blood bank in that hospital, as opposed to the one where I had trained previously, when it received donor blood, it centrifuged the blood into two uh, bags, a bag of cells, packed red blood cells, and a bag of straw-colored plasma, the liquid. And they were connected by a tube, and the proper procedure is when the blood bank delivered the blood to the bedside, I, the doctor, was supposed to squeeze the plasma bag so the, the plasma would go back into the red cells and, would, and whole blood would be reconstituted. I didn't know that, I didn't see it, but Mike did. Mike saw the bag of clear plasma dangling down from the apparatus. I was transfusing the baby with packed blood cells. Uh, we rescued the baby. I believe the baby in, in the end went, went home uh, okay, but I'm not sure. Mike knew I was devastated. Mike put his arm around me and said, uh, this could have happened to anyone. Not for a moment did I believe that. It was me. I was stupid. I had done something lethal, potentially, and it was, it was my fault, not their fault. Um, I went to the, to the on-call room after that with baby was stabilized, and I, uh, and I cried. That's the first story. So the second story now is a little bit farther along, and I was moonlighting to make some extra money at the Martha's Vineyard Hospital uh, near Boston, um, and which I did every, on weekends. In those days, I, it was a 48-hour shift. I flew to the hospital at, uh, on Friday and worked for 48 hours and flew home uh, on uh, Sunday. Um, a a five-year-old boy came in with swollen eyes. It was allergy season. I had swollen eyes. I, I, pollen allergies. And so I looked at the kid and I said, oh, this is allergies. And I put him on an antihistamine and sent him home. Um, a couple weeks later, I was back at the hospital and the head nurse, Jan, uh, pulled me aside and she said, oh, by the way, that kid, uh, he had not allergies. He had nephrotic syndrome, a problem with his kidneys that I completely missed, a rookie error. The hallmark presentation of nephrotic syndrome includes swollen eyes. But I went to the more familiar diagnosis. Luckily, I think that child was okay. I wasn't. Uh, really stupid, I felt. How could I be so stupid? The third uh, story is when I was uh, officer of the day in my pediatric practice, in, which meant I saw walk-in patients. And one of the walk-in patients was a teenage girl uh, who I'd never met before. She was a little short of breath. She was wheezing. I again went to a, a common explanation, asthma. I gave her asthma medications and went to my next patient. Uh, the next day, I came into the office and the chief of my department, Doris, was waiting, was there, and she said, oh, by the way, that girl that you saw yesterday um, had a cardiac arrest at home overnight. She's in the ICU and she is brain dead. And three days later, she died. There was no autopsy. 
I never learned anything more about what happened, nothing. Now I could go on, I could, I could consider myself a good doctor sometimes, but at times those like that, not. These, these are scarring episodes that, that stick with me. Um, to say they shook my confidence is a big understatement. I was so, trying so hard to help, and yet I, I did harm. And these stories haunt me. They haunt me many more nights than you would possibly imagine. These stories have three attributes in common, attributes you've heard speakers today and, and uh, tomorrow, that we'll hear tomorrow. Here are the three attributes they have in common. The first is they felt like personal failures. Uh, in each case, I knew something was wrong with me. Uh, I've been teaching systems thinking for four decades now. I have studied dozens of books and papers on safety, and quality, and human error. I can teach why blame is not a good idea. I can teach why hindsight bias is a tremendous trickster. I know all that. I know that usually when the holes in the Swiss cheese line up, it's not a person doing that. It's, it's a system, a set of system conditions. But in my heart, at night, uh, recalling the hot surge of crisis, in each of those moments and many others, none of the science helps me, none of it. I felt awful, I felt wrong, I felt defective, and frankly, I still do. The second thing these, these incidents have in common is that they were and are secrets. Not totally, of course. Uh, uh, Mike, the NICU senior resident who came to rescue me and Jan, the ER nurse, and Doris, my friend and chief of pediatrics, they knew, they knew the story in each case, and they all consoled me, and I don't think any of them blamed me. I took on that job. But beyond those tight circles of colleagueship and friendship, these stories ended. They dissolved like smoke. They were not reported, they were not recorded, nor, I suspect, were they really retold. All the information was lost. And frankly, at the time, I surely hoped they weren't retold. Um, I felt bad enough already. I felt shamed enough within myself. I, I, was, I wounded myself by myself. I didn't need wounds from anyone else. I also, by the way, in terms of secrecy, strongly suspect that neither the patients nor their families never knew my name. They never knew what, what had happened, not the details possibly not even that an error had occurred. I, I, nev I never closed the loop. I never went to the parents of that new newborn and said, by the way, last night I almost killed your, ch your child. And I don't think anyone did. The third uh, of the three factors that they have in common and closely related to the guilt and the secrecy was what happened afterward in each of those three cases. Of course, with baby Jones and the kid with nephrotic syndrome, uh, they, were, they were cared for. There was follow-up care clinically to help them as individuals. I'm pretty sure that the family of that dead teenager got consolation from a lot of people. But for the risks and the causes of each of those stories, what happened next is very easy to summarize. Nothing happened. For the exchange transfusion, and its related systems issues like how blood was managed in the blood bank and the training of a young resident and the supervision uh, of the transfusion itself, perhaps the communication against an authority gradient. Did the nurse see it and not tell me? I have no idea. What I know is nothing was learned, nothing changed. For my botched diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome, something changed. Change. I mean, I'll, I'll never make that error again, I'll tell you that, but nothing was learned, nothing changed for the next child with swollen eyes and the next physician so challenged. And for the mysterious death <coughs> of that teen, um, nothing changed. Was it a misdiagnosis by me? Uh, was it an error in the pharmacy? Did you get the wrong meds? Was it an idiosyncratic reaction to, to, to my treatment? Uh, was it something else entirely? I have absolutely no idea. No one has any idea, and no one ever will. Uh, case closed, dead. Now, as I said at the beginning, I don't think we should despair. 
there is progress now. Uh, safety is a thoroughly accepted topic in our industry. We're here today together. Uh, there are dozens of aspects of progress on central line blood stream infections and ventilator pneumonias and, and uh, catheter-induced uh, urinary tract infections. We've, we've, we've made measurable progress, and we have tremendous scholarships, scholarly journals on patient safety, and we've imported the scholarship of people like Naj into our industry, so we have a tremendous basis for action. And we have um, some proofs of concept. Uh, you heard some in the panel, first panel this morning where things start to be sounding like they're working right. And we have the direct interest of regulators, agencies, researchers, and others. Uh, we, and we have emerging frameworks for action plans. I'll show you some when I'm done. Um, and uh, we have patients. We have a strong and badly needed will-building activity from patient activists like Patients for Patient Safety US. And we have the PCAST report, which I'll come to also in a few minutes. Uh, actual interest from the highest levels in this government. Um, and we have promise from AI. You heard that in uh, uh, a few minutes ago. Um, again, Mike, I need your uh, counsel here. I had planned on a somewhat longer talk. Okay. About to bring you down, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, I think things might be better today. Different stories. Maybe the the nothing happened part would be different, but I I'm not sure. Would the death in the NICU have become known today and talked about and looked at without blame? Without blame? Would my diagnostic error have been studied and mapped into the work of the, uh, on, on diagnostic excellence into, uh, launched by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and with the sudden death be investigated. I don't know, that kid died at home and I just don't know what the loops of knowledge would have done to actually bring that question back to the table. What I do think is that if we're gonna make substantial progress in the field that we're here to talk about, we've got to make some changes. And, and I wanna to talk to you about a way to think about the barriers that, that, that we need to overcome. The framework I'm gonna use briefly in five minutes comes from my colleague, Tom Nolan. Tom was the most powerful mind in the world of improvement that I ever met. My chief mentor, he died a couple of years ago. I miss him every day. And constantly innovating in the way we think about um, making anything better. Tom said, if you want to change something, it's just a big system, or I'd say even personal life, there are three essential resources you need. He called them will, ideas, and execution. If you want to learn Spanish, you've got to have will. There has to be a reason to do it, a reason why the status quo is not comfortable enough for you and the future is more attractive, will. Ideas are ways to do it. Like, how do you, how do you learn Spanish? What, what are, anyone know Duolingo? Yeah, so you need ideas to put into action. And then you need execution, which is the day-to-day -day work, the hard work of actually making uh, change. Improving patient safety is a lot harder than stopping smoking or learning Spanish because it's fundamentally interdependent. You can't do it on one path. I can learn Spanish on my own pretty much if I had the will, ideas, and execution, but I'm not going to improve safety alone. It's got to be done all together. It's we, not me. And by the way, the psychology I described to you of those incidents I'm involved in is, is standing against the we-ness of the safety agenda. Um, because I, I believe I'm at fault. I don't frame the problem as we, we've got to work together. I frame it as I'm stupid and I ought to maybe not be a doctor. Um, would, would today's junior resident caught in that NICU situation talk about it, raise it, converse about it in your organization? Would that become a resource for protecting the next baby or not? Uh, using this framework, we can explore the possibility of change. How are we doing on will? Not so hot. There are a ton of senior leaders in this country and boards who don't believe patient safety is a problem. If they do believe it's a problem, they believe there's a lot of other stuff on their plate right now. Uh, climate change, workforce shortages, uh, value-based purchasing, uh, and a long list of stuff they have to attend to. I don't think we have built the will in the C-suites yet to make this uh, at the absolute top of the jobs to do. 
And if we do believe safety is a problem, many, many places, unlike Orange County Children's Hospital, believe that it doesn't apply to them. It's not us. Uh, we believe instead that when things go wrong, it's because stuff happens. And even the evidence isn't good enough. David Bates' study, 24% uh, of patients in hospital, 3,000 patients in 11 Massachusetts hospitals, using the exact same methods that OIG used, that were used in the Harvard Medical Practice Study, 24% of patients had injuries in major hospitals in Massachusetts. Despite that, we do not program this for, um, for success. We have, I think, in a way, and I don't know how to say this other than in an insulting way, ignorant leadership. They're not evil leadership. They're not care, uncaring leadership. They're not people who don't, aren't as good as me or they, they come to work wanting to do well, but they simply don't understand the scientific foundations for making reliability and safety happen. Why would they? They, they haven't been there. Uh, my, my, um, my students uh, uh, at Harvard, uh, Swas Gandhi and Sanjay Kishore, published this paper last year showing 14.6% of board members at 15 major medical centers had anything to do with the health profession, had ever seen a patient. We've established governance systems in which the people governing our healthcare system do not understand care. We have to change it. Frankly, I think if I could make one change at that level right now would be to insist that every hospital and every health organization have a majority of clinicians and patients on their boards, a majority, not just. Um, and now, as you know, we can spend the, all the limited time I have left talking about it. Money is taking over health care. The, the, the control from venture capital and uh, private equity and, and, and just the, the profiteering is just taking over the world of health care in a way that's demoralizing us. The morale is still there. I remember doing the 100,000 Lives campaign and seeing the emotion build uh, in, in the places that were involved. This is a, a group of people in, in, in Badger Stadium in Wisconsin uh, in the 100,000 Lives campaign day, two, 2004. The, 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 the hospital leaders in, in, in Madison, Wisconsin had outlined, you see the yellow balloons back there, uh, I think it was 1,500 seats in Badger Stadium because that's the number of lives they announced they intended to save. Will ideas, ideas are, are, are copious. We have tremendous science available to us. Uh, if I had more time today, I would work you through what I have done here, which is uh, put together a bibliography, six books, uh, which contain a tremendous amount of the knowledge we have about safety and reliability. Peter Senge's book on systems, the fifth discipline, uh, the Improvement Guide from Tom Nolan, uh, Chris Argeris' work on the, uh, the uh, psychology of organizational defensiveness, uh, uh, amazing book by Carl Weick and Kathleen Sutcliffe summarizing state of knowledge about high reliability, uh, Don Norman's incredible book about human factors called The Design of Everyday Things, and, hum and then Jim, Jim Reason's uh, landmark initial book on human error is still the best in the business. What I'm suggesting is preparation of leaders, and I think clinicians in healthcare, needs to include uh, knowledge of the sciences of safety and systems at the same level of seriousness that we take knowledge of the human body uh, or the art of surgery. On execution, um, some good news, but we still haven't embedded in healthcare systems the level of expertise needed that, that to get the results they're getting at Orange County, for example. Um, and that is, remains because of a lack of attention of boards and executives. Uh, the other thing is when we do devote attention to these issues, they tend to come into the, in the guise of corporate risk management that is wrong. Corporate risk management ha is, has is not even closely related to the management of patient risk, and, and we need to keep that in mind. Now, I... Um, have a lot more I, I wish I could say, but I'm, I'm out of time. What I will say is this, times are changing. If we could get the will of executives, boards, and governors to start to grapple with this uh, problem of changing the fate of patients, uh, we have the ideas, the science is there, we have the examples like the Orange County example, we have uh, uh, a, a community of scholars and leaders willing to help now we need frameworks that become mandatory. 
uh, the work on the National Action Alliance that began with ARC and IHI a number of years ago uh, is really got some traction now. And most exciting to me is the PCAST report. I don't know, I, I'd have to um, rely on Joe for his inside knowledge, but we and the PCAST working group handed to the White House a report on PCAST, on transformational effort on patient safety. That's the report I spoke about in my speech last year. It's, on the, it's in the Oval Office. We know in September 17th, I think it is, there's gonna be an event at, at the White House or Executive Office Building. I, don't, I have no idea what that design of that event is, but if we can take this report seriously, uh, a recommendation on, on true federal leadership from the White House on the improvement of patient care as a national priority, uh, ensuring that patient care is evidence-based to, to the extent we can at the level of rigor that Joe Chiani has been preaching for a long time, with patients in the driver's seat, as Sue Sheridan and Helen Haskell are telling us, nothing should happen without the complete involvement of patients and families and a very tight research agenda uh, fully supported to get us to knowledge about what high reliability care looks like in healthcare. And I believe led by the federal care systems, the VA, the DOD health system and, uh, and uh, the Indian Health Service. I think we know what to do. The, ga the goal is to change the story, change the story of what, uh, of me, that, that resident there at three in the morning, you know, 26 years old, almost killing a baby. What do you want that story to be in your hospital? But what's the right story? What I told you was the wrong one. Secrecy, fear, guilt, and nothing, no action. If we're gonna change that, uh, the test of effectiveness is whether that set of behaviors and assumptions would change. Would the family be told? Would, this, would we take a systems view? Would, we, would blame not be in the picture? And would someone be responsible for seeing that that happens? And would the next newborn be better off? And maybe, maybe part of it is would I be less scarred maybe? That's not the primary point, but we are here to do a good job and we want to do that job. And when failure happens, everybody gets hurt. And it's time to change that. Thank you for the chance to share these thoughts with you.